So, let's get started. Uh, today's topic is methodology one. And to explain what I mean by that, let's look at a um, slide from the last lecture. I hope you all remember this. This is the basic machine learning recipe. And this is the, um, the sort of the heart, the very simplest way to do machine learning in the heart of last week's lecture. So I hope you remember this. If not, please look at it again. The basic idea is that if you have some problem that you want to solve that you think might be useful to use machine learning for, these are the steps you take. You abstract your problem or part of your problem to a standard task like classification or regression. Then you choose your instances and their features and sometimes a target value. And then you pick a model class, something like linear models, uh, decision tree classifiers, KNN classifiers, something like that. You pick an algorithm. You apply it to these instances and their features. And then you search your model class, your model space for a good model. And then out pops a good model and that model solves your machine learning problem for you. Um, so in the very simplest way of thinking about it, this is what all machine learning is. And what we're going to do today is we're go uh, and this week, in fact, we're going to talk about everything around this algorithm. So not the uh, sorry, this recipe. So not the recipe itself. We assume that you've picked something like a linear model, and you're going to use that to solve your problem. But what do you do? before this? How do you prepare your data? How do you choose your features? How do you choose your instances? How do you look at your data? So that's what you do before the recipe. We're going to talk about that on Thursday. And what do you do afterwards? Because usually you don't just pick your model class based on intuition and say, well, that's it. That's what I'm going to use. You try a couple of them. You try a couple of them. You look how well they do, and then you pick the best one. And that can be surprisingly tricky to do that correctly. And if you don't do it correctly, you end up getting yourself thinking you have better performance than you do and picking the wrong model. So that's what we're going to talk about today. How do you uh, choose from, uh, how do you, if you have a couple of models that you'd like to try, how do you choose between them? How do you evaluate them against each other? This is the plan for today which again, I will write down. Uh, so first we're going to talk about performing experiments. Which is to say, how do you set up this machine learning recipe so that you can you get something out of it, a number, a value that you can trust, that you can rely on, and that you can use to judge uh, which machine learning model you should use. Then we're going to talk about what to measure exactly. So we've seen a few of these things already, uh, specifically accuracy. In the case of a classifier, uh, we've talked about looking at the number of misclassified examples. Uh, but there are a lot of other things you can measure, both in classification and regression, that sometimes work a lot better than accuracy. Then somewhere here will be a break, maybe slightly before. Then we get into the slightly hairier subject of analyzing the results, which is to say, if you have classifier A and you get accuracy this, and you have classifier B and you get accuracy that, then you can say, well, this number is higher than that number, so accuracy, uh, classifier B is higher or better. Um, but we haven't really talked about statistics yet. We haven't really talked about, is that effect that you've observed, one classifier does better? Is it due to a fundamental property of the classifiers that you've chosen? Or is it due to chance, which is always a possibility? Um, so we're going to talk about that. And then finally, briefly, I would like to discuss something called the no-free 
lunch uh, principle or no free lunch theorem, uh, which is a sort of guiding principle in machine learning, which can be important. So that's what we'll end on. Let's start with a motivating example. This is a uh, an article recent, uh, well, recently, uh, that not too long ago appeared in a Dutch newspaper. Oh, it's 2014. Well, a few years ago appeared in a Dutch newspaper. Apologies to the English people. Um, basically, what this article is about is a, a Dutch, big Dutch program for um, essentially blanket breast cancer screening for women over over 40 or 50, I think, over 50. Uh, so if you're a Dutch woman over 50, then every two years you get a leaflet in your mailbox saying you're invited to a breast cancer screening and the leaflet emphasizes that this is a good idea and that you should do it. And occasionally this discussion pops up asking whether actually this is a good idea. Now obviously getting breast cancer is a horrible disease and if we can catch that early for a lot of women that's great. But we have a classification problem here. Basically, a breast cancer screening, we can look at that as a classifier. And classifiers make mistakes, just like breast cancer screenings do. So sometimes you get people who don't have breast cancer who get classified as having breast cancer. Or you get people who do have breast cancer who get classified as not having breast cancer. And both of them are not without uh, consequences. Because if you get falsely uh, diagnosed with breast cancer, the next step is usually taking a biopsy, so an invasive surgery. Uh, it might involve chemo, uh, which is a horrible, uh, horrible procedure. So all of these things, uh, even though it's very, very good and very valuable to catch this in time and to, uh, to test people, incorrectly classifying, incorrectly testing people has a negative outcome. So the answer to this question, should we do this? Should we have blanket breast cancer screenings in the Netherlands? Depends on the accuracy of the classifier. Depends on how often the classifier makes mistakes on both sides. And in this case, this is quite a difficult uh, classification task for two reasons. Firstly, let's say I have a, a, a classifier, I have a, a, a breast cancer screening, and I tell you that it has 99% accuracy. Now some of you might say, well, that's pretty good. Maybe not good enough, but it sounds pretty good, right? It sounds pretty impressive, 99%. But the prevalence of breast cancer, so the probability that some uh, one of these women being screened goes for a screening actually has breast cancer, is about 1%. So that means that if I make a classifier that just says nobody has breast cancer, I just say no to everything, very simple classifier, I would get 99% accuracy. Because 99% of the time I'm correct. So even though that sounds, in terms of accuracy, that sounds very impressive, it really isn't. Because of the class imbalance. The proportion of the positive class, in this case we call this the positive class, is so small in relation to the negative class that accuracy doesn't really mean anything. That basically, the accuracy starts at 99% and only the region between 99 and 100% is interesting for evaluation. So that's one reason why um, accuracy is not a good metric in this case to evaluate because there's a very high class imbalance. Another reason you might not want to use accuracy is the cost imbalance. So even if 50% of women had breast cancer and 50% didn't. The cost of getting it wrong one way versus the cost of getting it wrong the other way is very different. So the cost of incorrectly classifying somebody who has cancer as not having cancer is very high. And the cost of incorrectly classifying somebody who doesn't have cancer as somebody who does have cancer is also non-zero, but, mu but it's much lower. Basically, you would send them for a, a checkup, and we would find that they don't have cancer after all through some evasive procedures. So there's a cost and there's a risk associated, but it's a much lower cost than the other uh, misclassification. Uh, you see the same kind of cost imbalance in spam classification, for instance. 
So if we classify something as spam that isn't spam, it goes into the spam folder, and on Gmail, after 30 days, it gets deleted. So that's a very costly mistake. It basically means that you could lose a very important email. Whereas if we see something that is spam and we classify it as a normal email, we get a spam in our uh, spam email in our inbox and we're a little annoyed. So the costs are very different. And if you compute accuracy, you are weighing these costs the same. So that's what we don't want to do. Uh, the first advice that I want to give you, and maybe the most important, as a sanity check to catch all of the uh, to catch most of these things, is to always use a baseline. Basically, accuracy on itself or any performance measure on itself doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything to say 99% accuracy. It sounds impressive, but it doesn't mean anything because you don't know what other methods uh, get what accuracy on this problem. So baselines help you solve this problem. Baselines are basically very simple approaches to your problem that you test to get a bearing on how to calibrate this, uh, this accuracy level. So a simple one is the majority class that I described uh, just now, which basically looks at which class, uh, this is in classification obviously, it looks at which class is most prevalent, so women who don't have breast cancer, and I'm always going to say that. I'm just always going to cl classify everything as the majority class. It's not a very useful classifier, but the accuracy level of that classifier gives you a reading on what kind of accuracy levels are re uh, reasonable. Uh, you can also take a random choice by class probability, which would do slightly worse than the majority class for imbalanced classes. Uh, but then you get a classifier that at least makes different choices. It can be useful. Um, and often if you're building a very complex system, it's good to also build a very simple system next to it. So just take some linear classifier on just whatever features you have available and see how well that does. Because it tells you whether or not all that extra complexity that you're putting into your model, putting into your pipeline, into your design, is actually justified. If a linear classifier does just as well, then it's not justified. And of course, if your aim is to beat existing methods, if there are existing methods in the research, existing methods that already exist, and you want to show that you're doing better than them, then you want to compare to those methods. So you want to include those, and that's, those are also called baselines. So that's a very good sanity check. If you include, if you check a few of these baselines, you don't always have to include them in your paper for like majority class. But if you just check them, it will give you a good bearing on what kind of accuracy is actually impressive. Uh, it turns out that sklearn actually has a breast cancer data set. So uh, if you want to try this, you can just import the data set directly from sklearn and you get an X, uh, X matrix and a label vector. It looks like this on the first, I think the first and the fourth feature. It looks like this. Uh, the class imbalance is a little bit less here, so there are a lot more positive examples. Uh, so you can play around with this. Another slide from last week, just to remind you, uh, was about overfitting. So these are, mo these are models that do uh, very well on the training data, that perform on the data that's given to them, the data that they get to see. They classify pretty much perfectly. This is a decision tree classifier. This is a decision tree regression. So this line, as you can see, hits almost every point in the training set. And here, almost every blue point. Now, in fact, every blue point is classified as blue, and every red point is classified as red. So if you look at the accuracy on the training data, these are perfect, uh, perfect models but they're not very useful because this here there's absolutely no reason region sorry there's absolutely no reason to assume from the data that this particular region should be a narrow rectangular region of blue it's sort of um, memorizing the training data and drawing too many conclusions and too specific conclusions from the training data and this is basically an illustration of the fact that in machine learning, the task is not to minimize our loss or to minimize our accuracy, maximize our accuracy on the training data, 
our aim is to accurate uh, to um, minimize our loss on unseen data. So we train our model, we get some new data that we've never seen before, and then we test on that. And if the accuracy is high there, then we can say it's a good model. Uh, usually we don't actually go out and get new data once we've trained our model. What we actually do is we withhold part of our data as test data. Uh, proportion is not very important. It's very important that you do this. The proportion is not uh, super important. Should it, you should have at least 100 examples in the test set. Actually, 1,000 is better and 10,000 is ideal. We'll see why later on at the end of the lecture. So first thing you do in any machine learning project is split off your test and your training data and use only your training data. But then you usually want to do something called hyperparameter selection. The hyperparameters of a model are those parameters that are chosen by you based on intuition or dumb luck and that are not trained on the data. So for instance, this is a picture I showed you for the k-nearest neighbor classifier, which doesn't learn, which just looks at the data and to classify this point looks at the nearest uh, seven points in this case and picks the most prevalent class among the nearest points. It's the nearest neighbor classifier. But it's called a k-nearest neighbor classifier because you have to uh, choose beforehand how many neighboring points it looks at. So in this case, it looks at seven neighboring points it could also look at 15 neighboring points or any number. So that number k, that's a hyperparameter. You have to choose it. So let's do that. We split our data into test and training data. And for every value of k between 2 and 14, well, 15, I guess, we train a classifier, train a classifier, which is k and n doesn't train, but we make one of these classifiers with this k value, and we check on the test set what the accuracy is. Right? Simple. So this tells us that k uh, equals 5 gives us a much, much better performance than any of the other values. These are all below uh, 0 0.2, and this is just above 0 0.5. It's not great performance, but gives us the best performance. So you might be forgiven, looking at this, for thinking that k is 5 is the best uh, hyperparameter setting for this problem. I should say I use a test set of only 15 examples, just to emphasize the problem a little bit. So this is a small test set. That also means I can do it again, because I have lots of data left over. So I can do this again on another test set and see what I get then, and again, and again, and again. And the results look like this. So here we see at the bottom still the green line that we had for the first run. So the first thing to notice is that we have incredibly high variance for our estimate of the accuracy. So on, another, on this test set, we usually got an accuracy of about 0 0.1, a little over 0 0.1. On another test set, sampled completely randomly from the data in exactly the same way, we get over 0 0.9 for OK. It's because we have such a small test set. But more importantly, our conclusion from this experiment that we drew, k equals 5 is a good value, completely doesn't hold for any of the other test sets. So for this pink one, k is 3 is much better. For the orange one, k is 3 is also better. But suddenly, k is 7 is also very good. Uh, for this pink one, also k is 3. So what we're seeing here is that we're essentially, uh, by uh, reusing the test set over and over again, we are essentially overfitting again on the whole data. We are overfitting on the test data. We are using multiple testing to test multiple hypotheses on the test data, and we are drawing wrong conclusions because we're overusing this data. So we're drawing the wrong conclusions. To solve this, there are a um, couple of ways to solve this, uh, different approaches, and it would be wrong to suggest that this is the way that's always used in the literature. 
Uh, but as far as I can tell, this is the simplest way that gives you a good result. So this is, if I can give you one recipe for doing this, for doing uh, machine learning research and proper hyperparameter selection, I would say follow this recipe. And you might, if you ever start reading machine learning papers, you might see papers where a different recipe is followed. You might see a lot of papers where they get it wrong. Um, in general, I think this is agreed to be the simplest, best way. And it works like this. So first we split our um, data into train and test data, as we did before. And then the test data we put away. We lock away and we never look at it again until the very end of our project. Then we start choosing our models, start choosing our hyperparameters, start choosing our feature extraction, start choosing our data pre-processing, and all of these things that are all part of our machine learning approach, we choose them by looking only at the training set. I'm going to go into how to do that later, because you still need splits here. You still can't evaluate on the training on the data that you use to train. Then you draw a conclusion, and you state your hypothesis. So you look at all this data and you say, well, with these parameter settings, I can beat the baseline. With these parameter settings, I get this kind of accuracy. Or this parameter setting, hyperparameter setting, is better than this hyperparameter setting. It depends on what you're trying to do, what you're trying to prove. But you state it, you state your hypothesis, and then you do one test on the test data. You use your test data only once, and only then do you get a proper, reliable result. So how do we do this? How do we use this training set to do this hyperparameter selection? Well, the simplest way is just to split it again. So we take our data, split off the test set, and the remaining data we split into a training and a validation set. And then when we're doing our model selection and our design, our hyperparameter selection, we train on the training de data, test on the validation to compare these different hyperparameters. And then the final run that we do for our paper, where we're going to report the results, we train on the training plus the validation data, and we test on test data. Okay, uh, so the question is, uh, let's say you've uh, normalized your data, for instance. So you, do you, you do some data pre-processing. Are you allowed to reuse those settings that you uh, came up with on the uh, in the final run, right? Uh, I'd say yes. Those are also hyperparameters, as it were. So you have to, um, here you have to sort of, once you start doing this, you have to, Actually, that's a good question. So once you're doing this, you have to treat your model as a single model that gets your data and produces an output. So it has two kinds of parameters, the hyperparameters that you've chosen before. So those are the parameters that you don't learn from the data. Those are the ones you select here. And the regular parameters that you learn from the data. So those you should learn from this combined data set. Um, so actually, I think in this case, it would work better if you normalize based on this data, because you have a bit more data here, and this is the data that you're actually going to use. So you're allowed to normalize on the combined training and validation data, and that will work better. You're also allowed to use the normalization settings from here. That's up to you, but I think the latter would, uh, the first would work better. Um, because of all this splitting, as you can see, you end up maybe with a lot less training data than you originally thought you had. And you might want to be a bit more efficient and use a bit more of your data. Uh, and you can do that with a trick called cross-validation. So here again, we split off our training and test data. We don't look at the test data unless we've cho until we've chosen our hyperparameters. But then for each hyperparameter setting, we can do multiple runs in this way. 
So we split our training data into five chunks. And we do five different runs with each chunk as the validation set. So then we get five different performance values, let's say accuracy. And then we just average these accuracies. And that allows us to make much better use of our data. We've used all our data as training data and we've used all our data as validation data. Uh, and yet we haven't cheated. We've always trained on one set of the data and validated on the other, set of the, uh, the other part of the data. The only drawback is that this can be a little expensive because for every hyperparameter that you want to test, you have to train and test five different times. So this can be, uh, yeah, if your training and testing, if your training is uh, expensive, then this can be an expensive process. But in general, it makes very good use of your data. So just to emphasize, this is something you see a lot in um, machine learning papers, in bad machine learning papers, where you uh, report the results. Let's say these are accuracy results across a few different data sets. You put your baselines at the top. You say, well, these are baseline accuracies. And then you report your accuracies for a huge list of hyperparameters. And then you get lots of good numbers, so you make those bold. You make this bold and this bold. And you say, see, with our model, you can get better accuracy. The problem is, if I want to apply this to my data set, data set, uh, oh, this should be three, so data set four. I want to apply this to data set four which is my data set, then this doesn't tell me which hyperparameter I should use. And I don't get to repeat this, uh, the thing that they did here. So I don't get to try all the different hyperparameters and select the best one, unless I make a test and training set and do the training uh, internally. Uh, so you're slightly cheating here in the way that I described earlier. And what you should actually see is this. So baselines were fine. You report your baselines. You do your hyperparameter selection based on just your training data using this trick I showed earlier with the validation set. You choose your hyperparameters. You report them in your paper. Tell people how they were chosen. They can be different for each data set. That's allowed. You can have different hyperparameters per data set. And then you report your results on the test set once. And as you can see, the numbers have slightly gone down. So here, here, oh, here, the authors might have reported the results as state of the art because they beat the baselines. And here, they are merely competitive. They are roughly in the same range as the baselines. Uh, that's a good question. So uh, the question is, if you use different hyperparameters for different data sets, is that still reliable for a real world case? So the question is always, for me as a practitioner with my own data set, can I do the same thing? So if you use different hyperparameters, but choose them through internal uh, cross-validation, so this cross-validation technique or with a training and validation set, then I can do the same thing. I can take my data and I can split it up. And I don't have a test set because I'm a practitioner. So I take my data and split it up into a training and test set and pick the best hyperparameters. If I do that, then I can be sure that on my once I put it into production, then it's going to see new data. So that's sort of what the test set is, uh, is meant to mimic, the production data. So I can be sure or relatively sure once I put it into production that these numbers generalize because I've done the same, I've selected my hyperparameters the same way the authors did. And then this was an estimate of how um, that whole algorithm, including hyperparameter selection functions on unseen data then I can be sure that that maps to my case. And I can use these numbers as an indication. Obviously, the domain is different, so it might slightly differ. But still, then it's a fair indication. Um, 
the question is still how do you select your hyperparameters? So which case are you going to even try? And if you have a different hyperparameters, which value of each are you going to try? Mostly that's up to you. Once you set up this test set and this training set properly, anything you do on your training set to select your hyperparameters is up to you. You can do anything you like. So long as you never ever look at your test set, you are being, uh, uh, you're not cheating, basically. Uh, so there's a good, uh, here's a, a few strategies you might use. Uh, often it's just trial and error. You just try a couple of values. You use it to inform your intuition about the algorithm. You try a couple more values until you get something you're happy with. If you don't get something you're happy with, you can use grid search. So basically if you have two parameters, A and B, uh, and you pick a couple of values for A, let's say 1, 2, 3, 4. And you pick a couple of values for B, let's say 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001. And obviously these ranges depend entirely on what the hyperparameters do. Sometimes you get these kinds of parameters, sometimes this. It depends entirely on the algorithm, so we'll see for each algorithm what the hyperparameters are in later lectures. So we have four values here and three values here, and we just make a big grid with the Cartesian product of everything against everything, and we test all of them. That's called grid search. As you can see, it's quite expensive, especially for every cell in your grid you have to do five-fold cross-validation. It can take a long time. So you can also do one factor at a time. So you just pick one A, and you test all the Bs. You say, well, this is the best. Then starting here, I'm going to test all the As. And then I take the best, uh, the best option I've seen. Uh, and if you want to go super complicated, you can do something like random search. Those of you who have seen the lecture of Thursday will remember what random search is. Basically, you pick a random set of parameters. You pick a value nearby. And if it's better, you switch to that. And then you pick another value nearby, and so on and so on. And then you can go into any kind of search method, like evolutionary search or simulated annealing. You can apply all these things to hyperparameter selection. But mostly, start with trial and error. See if you can just find a couple of good values randomly. So that's how to perform an experiment in machine learning. So then the question is, what do we measure for these experiments? Uh, and most of this... Uh, what I'm going to say about that is going to be about binary classification, like the um, breast cancer case. So first, a little bit of um, terminology. In binary classification, you usually designate one of the classes the positive class and one of the classes the negative class. And the positive class is basically the thing you're trying to detect. So if you have a classifier that decides between ham and spam, you are detecting spam, so spam is the positive class. Or if you're detecting breast cancer, then breast cancer is the positive class. So positive definitely doesn't mean good, because in the both those examples, these are not good things. But think of it as testing positive for a disease. That kind, that's the, the sense in which we're using the word. And the other is a negative class. Uh, so in this class, we have an accuracy of 11 over 14 and an error over... Three, uh, 3 over 14 because there are 3 misclassified points. Uh, let's say we don't like the accuracy for some reason. First thing we can do is split it up into what's called a confusion matrix or a... a con well, there's another word that slipped my mind at the moment, so let's call it a confusion matrix. Where we just say this is what the actual class was, this is what the model predicted. So there are six cases where the model, uh, where the actual class was positive, blue, and the model predicted blue as well. 
So those are these points here. There is one case where the model predicted negative in the actual class. Uh, sorry, there's uh, these might be the wrong way around. Let me see. No, so there are two cases where the model predicted positive and the actual class was negative, these two. There's one case where the model predicted negative but the actual class was positive and five uh, correctly predicted negatives. And if you have a big class imbalance, like the situations I sketched earlier, you get something like this. So there are 200 uh, positive classes and uh, 200 positive examples, 20 negative examples. And here we've sketched it, uh, we've, uh, I've drawn the performance of a classifier that always predicts positive. As you can see, we predict 200 exa positive examples correctly, 200 negative examples incorrectly, zero on both sides. So we get good accuracy. Accuracy, as you can see, is the uh, sum of the diagonal the number of correctly predicted, predicted positives plus the number of correctly predicted negatives, divided usually by the total. So we get um, 220 over, uh, 200 over 220 accuracy, uh, but it's not a very interesting classifier. So there are a few extra um, values you can get from your confusion matrix. The accuracy, as I said, is the uh, diagonal. The oh yeah, first some names, sorry. So when the uh, classifier predicts it as a positive, and that's correct, we call it a true positive. So now the positive refers to what the um, classifier predicted. The classifier predicted as a positive but got it wrong, we call it a false positive. So the false and true refers to whether or not the classifier was right. If the classifier predicted negative but was wrong, we call it a false negative. And if the classifier predicted negative but got it right, we call it a true negative. So two things we can compute is the true positive rate, which is out of... Um, the true positives and the false negatives, so this row, out of all the actual positives, how many did we correctly identify as positive? How, did, how many did we predict were positive? And the false positive rate is out of this rate, out of this row, so out of all of the uh, actual negatives, how many of those did we incorrectly predict were positive? So these, the false positive rate Sorry, the true positive rate and the false positive rate are both values about the positives we predicted. How many of it, them did we get right and how many of them did we get wrong? Proportional to how many true positives there were and how many actual positives there were, how many actual negatives there were. So these are kind of our, um, if we look, if we have a, a problem with class imbalance, these are kind of two things we want to maximize separately. These are two things we are interested in maximizing and trading off. So every false positive is, uh, sorry, every true positive extra is good. Every, the more positives we identify out of the total existing positives, the happier we are. But the fewer false positives, so the fewer of the existing negatives we identify as positives, uh, the happier we are. These are two different things that we have to trade off. So we have two, ob two objectives instead of one. And we can put these into uh, axes, which we call the ROC space. It stands for the receiver operating characteristic. It's one of these machine learning words that you just have to, well, take my word for it. That's what it's called. And I don't, uh, I won't try to explain why it's called that. It's just the word we ended up for, uh, ended up with for this uh, concept. So we put the true positive rate here, false positive rate here, and then for a bunch of classifiers, we can plot them in this space, and we can see which is better than which. So this one, this one, is always worse than both these ones. 
because it has a worse false positive rate and a worse than this one and a worse true negative rate than this one. These are two classifiers that we can always create easily. So we can always get a zero true positive rate and a zero false positive rate by simply never classifying anything as positive. Then we never classify anything correctly as a true positive, but we also don't classify anything correctly as a positive. And this one we can get by classifying everything as positives. Because then we get the full true positive rate, but we also know that all of the negatives have been classified as uh, as positives incorrectly. Uh, so this, these are these dots are all different classifiers. Remember that. And you can show quite easily that for any two classifiers that you can achieve. So we know we can achieve this, and we know we can achieve this. We can also achieve any classifier on this line by simply taking the two original classifiers and randomly picking one or the other as its example. So if we if we take a 50-50, uh, flip a coin, pick one of their, um, flip a coin, pick this guy's judgment classification if it lands heads, and this guy's judgment if it lands tails, we end up exactly in the middle. And if the coin is a little unbalanced, so if it, let's say, we pick this guy 75% of the time, this guy 25% of the time, then we end up about here. So in that case, we can take any mixture of these methods by just mixing together classifiers. Um, quite a way away from where the break was in my slides. So I suggest we take a break now. Uh, you digest this, and we will come back to this in uh, 15 minutes. All right, welcome back. Uh, as usual, a couple of interesting questions during the break, so let's go through those first before we return to the uh, receiver operating characteristic curves. Um, let's start mostly on these tables, what I meant by this uh, slide. Firstly, where do we get these numbers? I made these numbers up. These are the kinds of numbers you would see if people were to report like this. Um, but I made them up, so don't put too much stock in the precise numbers I chose here. Um, I labeled these things baseline 1, baseline 2. You should think of specific baselines. It's not like there's a generic baseline 1 that everybody always uses. This would be a majority vote or a competing model or something like that. Um, so let me try and um, explain quickly what exactly I meant here. So we have this hyperparameter k that we have to choose on the k nearest neighbor. And what the people who've made this table, what we assume they've done, is they have one training set. They've taken their data. They've split it into a training set and a test set. And then for every k they've trained on the training set, tested on the test set, and reported here what the result was on the test set. And what that tells us, what that sort of, uh, if I look at this as a practitioner, if I look at this as somebody with my own data, what this is sort of uh, simulating for me is the case where it's as if I pick a random k and then get one result on my data, on my unseen data, because once the system goes into production, that's when it's going to run on unseen data. And I want to get an estimate of how it does on this unseen data. So this is a case where I don't do any hyperparameter selection. I just pick some random k based on intuition. And I end up in one of these rows. So if I'm lucky, I end up here with 92% accuracy. If I'm unlucky, I end up here. So to avoid this, we do hyperparameter selection. We split our training set into training and validation, use this to select our hyperparameter, and then take that hyperparameter, put that into production. That's what you're simulating here. 
Sorry. My remote control is dying. That's what you're simulating here. So that's not just the k-nearest neighbor algorithm, but that's the k-nearest neighbor plus hyperparameter selection. Plus using, say, cross-validation here that gives you one model, that whole process. And then you estimate the accuracy of the model resulting from that process on your test data once. And then you get these numbers, which I made up, but they're slightly lower than the previous numbers because we cheated here. Uh, so back to the uh, ROC curve. Uh, final question that I got was, um, where do we get this? So we train, we train some classifiers. These are all different classifiers. Where do we get these numbers? Uh, this can happen both in your final phase when you're using your test data or during hyperparameter selection. You can also use ROC curves to, um, uh, ROC space to do hyperparameter selection. So in both cases, they're useful. Uh, we can uh, create any convex combination of two classifiers. Um, these are two other numbers that you will also see sometimes called precision and recall. Also used a lot in um, information retrieval. Um, precision is the same as the true positive rate. So we don't need to bother, bother about that. Recall is the false positives divided by the false positives plus the true negatives. So this. So it's the false positives divided by this. And I always forget what exactly precision and recall are. So I copy-pasted this very helpful diagram from Wikipedia, where you get your full uh, instance space, your full feature space. You have some relevant elements, the positives. And your classifier selects these as positives. So it manages to select a large chunk of the true, uh, of the actual positives. But it also, unfortunately, selects a large chunk of the other ones that it's not supposed to select. So how many of the items we selected, i.e. labeled as positive, are actually relevant, are actually positive? So how many of this, uh, this circle that we selected is green, is positive? And the uh, recall is the same, but divided by something else. So how many of the actual positives existing did we actually choose? Um, and I won't go into precision and recall any further, but basically anything we do with this ROC space, you can also do in a precision recall space. Because precision and recall are also two things you want to maximize, two things you want to trade off. So I'll do, we'll go for the ROC for now, but it basically works the same for uh, precision and recall. So uh, one important thing to remember is that these are different classifiers. We have plotted different classifiers in the ROC space in order to compare them, in order to see uh, on these two evaluation metrics which does better. But wouldn't it be nice if we could start with one classifier and give it a kind of button, a kind of dial we can uh, turn to make it more eager to classify things as positive. So we keep the same classifier, uh, but we give it a kind of parameter that tells us how eager it is to classify things as positive, how brave it is. So out here, it's not very brave at all. It doesn't want to make any mistakes under no circumstances whatsoever. So it just classifies nothing as positive. So it doesn't make any mistakes. None of the negatives are classified as positive. And the only way it can do that is li by labeling nothing as positive. And then we give it a little bit of bravery and it starts labeling only those things as positive of which it's very, very certain that it's positive. You will see it climbing here because here you can imagine the, the positives and it starts labeling some of these. Uh, and these it's very sure about so it's, we can be pretty sure that there are no negatives among the ones that it's labeling positive until it gets braver and braver and braver, and then it starts making some mistakes. So then it starts moving to the right as well, 
The bravery leads to some extra positive true positives. But we get some false positives as well. Until it gets braver and braver and braver. Until it gets so brave and so excited that it just labels everything as positive. And we end up here. So what you would get then is a classifier that traces out a curve through this space, an ROC curve. We call that an ROC curve. Though that would be really nice, because then we can just train one classifier and then set this threshold of bravery, as it were, to the level that we're happy with for our uh, cost imbalance and, and our class imbalance. So can we do that for any given classifier? The idea is to turn classifiers into ranking classifiers. And what a ranking classifier does, basically it doesn't just classify something as negative or positive, but it has the ability somehow by some arbitrary measure to rank things in terms of how negative and how positive they are. It can say this instance is more negative than this other instance. This email is more spammy than this email, even though they're both spam. Let's see how that works for a linear classifier, first of all. So we have here a linear classifier. We have the same data set I showed earlier. I've labeled the examples now from A, B, C, D, E, F, G for the uh, negative ones. And uh, T, U, V, X, Y, Z. I've deleted W for the uh, positive ones. And if you have a linear classifier, you can very easily turn it into a ranking classifier by just measuring the distance to the decision boundary. So how far away each point is from the decision boundary orthogonally. This is not quite properly orthogonal. But you measure the distance from the decision boundary, and that's how negative or how positive it is. So if you're super close to the decision boundary, a uh, classifier is very unsure. But it's very far away, like A, then it gets classified as very, very negative and Y gets classified as very positive. And we're only interested in the ranking. Ultimately, this score, this distance that it applies, which we call Z, is not very important. We are only interested in the ordering it applies on our data set. So once we have this, we can take our classification threshold and just move it. If we set it here, then everything is classified as positive. So we end up here. Uh, no, sorry. Then we end up here. So let's start here. Then if we uh, set the decision threshold here, everything is classified as negative. So we end up in this bottom left corner. And as we move it back, the classifier gets braver and braver and braver in classifying things as positive. Uh, so it's an interesting question to ask, how good is the ranking classifier doing? Can we measure not just how good the classification is, but can we measure also how many mistakes it makes in this ranking? Uh, one drawback is that we don't have a ranking for our true data set. We are only given positive and negative class labels. We don't know for the true uh, labels here, so between A, B, C, D, F, and G, which are actually, how they should actually be ranked, which are actually more or less negative. Uh, we only have those judgments for the classifier. But for some pairs in this data space, we do know which way around they should be ranked. If you have one positive example and one negative example, then you know that the positive example should be more to this side than the negative example. So for instance, T and C, or T and G, they're ranked the wrong way around. Because G is negative, so it should be on this side of T. So if we take all the pairs where one example is in one class and the other is in the other class, we can check for all those pairs whether or not they're correctly ranked and how often the classifier gets those wrong. We can do this by making a big table. Put all the positive examples on the vertical axis, all the negative examples on the... Uh, horizontal axis, and we put them in order of certainty. So this is a positive label for which the classifier, this is all in reference to a specific classifier, for which the classifier is most certain that it's positive, and this is the one for which the classifier is least certain that it's negative. 
So in both cases, we start here and we move that way. And then this table gives us all the pairs of one, uh, one positive and uh, one negative example. So for each of those pairs, we can see whether they're the correct way around. Other questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, so um, G and Y are the correct way around, because Y is on the positive side. But all the other ways, because G is so far this way, all the other ones are incorrectly ranked. So we label this as red. For F, we have four labels on the correct side and two on the wrong side. So four on the correct side, two on the wrong side, and so on for the others. This is called the coverage matrix. And it's basically our ROC space. So this, these are all the negatives. If we normalize this, the number here, if we divide this by the total number of negatives, so this goes from 0 to 1, and we divide this by the total number of positives, so this goes to 0 from 1, we end up with the ROC space, and we get something like this. So for a specific ranking classifier, these are all the, rank the classifiers that it creates for us. And these, this area under the curve is an estimator of the number, uh, is an estimator of the probability that we are going to make a ranking error. And the bigger the area under the curve, the better the classifier is in general, independent of how we make this trade-off between true uh, positive rate and false positive rate. So this area under the curve is an alternative to accuracy that is much more informative uh, when you have class imbalance or cost imbalance. But it depends on how you turn your classifier into a ranking classifier. We've seen how to do that for a linear classifier. But for every classifier, you have to decide a new how to do this. So if we have a decision tree classifier, which cuts this space into these uh, segments, these rectangular segments, what you usually do there is you look at each segment and you look at how much blue and how much red there is in the segment. And the higher the proportion of red, the more negative is it is, and the higher the proportion of blue, the more positive it is. And all the instances in that segment are equal to each other in the ranking, so you rank them the same. But if the segment is, uh, has a high proportion of blue, then you rank that segment as higher than a, high, than a segment with a high proportion, uh, with a higher proportion of red. So here we have a segment that is exactly equal and a segment that is bluish. So the bluish segment gets ranked higher than the equal segment which is ranked higher than this largely red segment, which is ranked even higher than this purely red segment. So it's just a way of turning a decision tree classifier into a ranking classifier, which gives us this coverage, um, uh, coverage matrix. And as you can see, you now get ties. You now get some uh, pairs that are in the same space together, these four pairs are in the same segment together, they get ranked the same, so they get tied, and then we color it uh, blue, uh, sorry, uh, yellow. Uh, so you need to, if you want to um, count the proportion of correct, uh, correctly ranked pairs to the total of, uh, to the proportion of total pairs, you need to take this into account. But you can easily see that as your data set grows, uh, this proportion uh, diminishes how much this counts. So in general, what you can just do is get your ranking classifier to give you a bunch of points, take the convex hull, and calculate the area under the curve. And that will give you usually uh, a good area under the curve. And of course, normally you don't have to do this yourself. SKLearn has, has utility methods to help you do this. So just a few things to reiterate. Accuracy 
is a metric for a single classifier. AUC is a metric for a collection of classifiers, usually gathered from a single classifier by turning it into a ranking classifier. But whenever somebody reports AOC or whenever somebody shows you an ROC curve, you have to ask yourself, where did they get this collection of classifiers? And how did they turn this classifier that they described into a ranking classifier? Because it matters for what your uh, ROC curve is. And it differs. For every classifier, you have to do this in a different way. Uh, so take that into account. Um, but if we have this class imbalance problem and if we have this cost imbalance problem, then ROC curves are a good way to visualize your performance. So there are two different methods. You can use ROC curves or ROC space as a visualizing method. Or if you really need one number, you can compute the area under the curve. Finally, ultimately, you want to end up with just one classifier. So you need to set the threshold somewhere. So you can show your domain expert or your practitioner the ROC curve or the PR curve and let them choose. But this can be, as I'm sure you're uh, sympathetic, this can be difficult to wrap your head around. This can be difficult to interpret, even if you understand perfectly well what a true positive and a false negative rate is. You still kind of, it's kind of difficult to map this to a real world problem and say, well, in breast cancer, it should be 0.3. We should our uh, false negative should be this high, or our false positive should be this high. So one way to um, deal with this, that's a little bit easier, is to uh, assign a cost to each misclassification. Sometimes a monetary cost, for instance, how much money does something cost you? Um, you can do a, uh, a cost in time. For instance, if I misclassify an email, spam email, as non-spam email, that's going to take me 30 seconds to resolve by reading the email and deleting it. Uh, if I do it the other way around and it ends up in, ends up in a proper email ends up in my spam box, then on average it will cost me an hour to realize that I've missed something and then find it in my spam box. So then you can measure these things. Then the cost of misclassifying a spam email is uh, 1 60th, no, 120th the cost of misclassifying a uh, non spam email. Uh, and with breast cancer, you can maybe do this in um, human life saved or uh, maybe time saved or human lives extended. It's, uh, it depends on the domain. Uh, but once you have this cost matrix, once you have the cost of each misclassification, you can just factor that into your loss model, into your loss function, and then minimize for your loss. So instead of minimizing for this abstract idea of loss, like a uh, uh, number of misclassifications, you are minimizing for the actual cost, the expected uh, cost. And the best way to do this is with a probabilistic classifier, so a classifier that actually gives you pr class probabilities which is something that we will be looking at next week, Monday. So we'll maybe come back to this. A uh, few things, small things to say about regression. <coughs> I won't go into it very deeply. Uh, we've seen the regression loss function already, the mean squared errors, um, which is usually also a good evaluation function. It's also a good thing to look at to interpret whether or not one model is better than another. But usually you take the root. So you uh, search for the smallest uh, squared errors or mean squared errors. But usually, once you report your loss, once you report what you actually found, how well your model actually does, <coughs> you take the, the root of that value. The idea being that you return your error function to the same units as your original space. So what we did here, so we have these errors, these residuals. Let's say we're predicting a number of centimeters. We're squaring these guys in order to make all this positive. 
that means our error, the dimensions, the, the, the units of our error are squared centimeters, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so if we take the uh, root, we go back to centimeters. And it's nice to have an error in centimeters because in general you uh, interpret the error as a kind of expectation of how wrong your classifier is going to get. So if you're predicting something in centimeters, then you want an error in centimeters as well instead of an error in squared centimeters because that's much more difficult to interpret. Um, finally, something you see with both uh, classifiers and uh, uh, regression is that your error is usually made up of two components. We're going to go deeper into this later, but just to give you a hint of the idea, basically you can, get, you can be wrong for two reasons. You can be wrong because you have a bias, or you can be wrong because you have variance. So if you repeat your experiments, let's say you gather new data from the same source, and you do the whole experiment again, you get a new error value, and you do it again and again and again, you get a new error value. Uh, and you can look at how those error values uh, relate. So if in all cases your error is always low, then you have just a very good model, which is analogous to just hitting a dartboard dead center every time. If you have high variance, then every time you repeat your, mo your experiment, uh, you get very different results, but the average of those results is pretty much dead center. So that's low bias, high variance. If you have bi high bias, you have a real, uh, strong error. You have exactly the same error every time. It's like a systemic error. And if you have high bias and high variance, then you get a big diverse point cloud very far away from your target. Um, Usually, if your model is too simple, you get a high bias. So if you think of a very noisy point cloud and you draw a line through it, it doesn't really matter how noisy, where the point cloud is really, uh, what, uh, how the noise is distributed, because you will always end up drawing the sa roughly the same line. So your error will all be th always be the same. But if your true model is not a line, but say a parabola, then you will still get it quite wrong. If your model is too complex, so you're overfitting, then one time your error goes this way, and the other time your error goes that way. And on average, you will still get a good model. Uh, but because you're overfitting on the noise part of your data set, you're remembering the noisy parts of your data set, your model is all over the place. So you might be forgiven when you look at this for thinking, well, clearly out of these two, uh, if I have to make a choice between high bias and high variance, Clearly, high variance is much better, because at least here I can just average these guys and just take the mean value. Um, there are two problems. First is that we have only one dart. I talked about gathering more data and repeating our experiments. We don't have more data. We have only one data set, so we get only one error. So you, don't really, you can't really tell. From one dart, you can't really tell whether you're here or here or here or even here, you don't really know. Secondly, it's kind of difficult to just average models. Uh, you can do the same thing as we saw with the RSC curve, where you just randomly take the answer from mo one model or the other. But if you have multiple data sets and you train multiple models, it's a kind of a question how you combine those different models in such a way that they're resulting error is the average of the individual errors. But it can be done, and that's called ensembling, and we're going to come back to that in week five. So this is the break, this is how optimistic I was in my planning. So I'm going to have to rush through this a little bit, I guess. Um, so some of you, maybe all of you, have taken a statistics course. Who's taken a statistics course? Well, a little over 50-50. Um, so it's important to realize that we haven't really done any statistics yet. 
So we've talked about how to set up an experiment and how to observe the results so that we might say classifier A is better than classifier B because the accuracy is 10 percentage points higher. But we don't know whether that observed effect is due to chance or due to structural properties of our model. Um, and it's kind of surprising given how many techniques machine learning shares with statistics, how many statistical methods we use, how many methods we borrow from statistics, that machine learning people are in general not very good and not very eager to do statistical analysis, not very good at and not very eager to do these. Um, so much so that at some point uh, a man called Leo Bryman in 2001 wrote uh, quite an influential article. He was a statistician and he wrote this article for statisticians saying, hey, there are these, uh, these other guys called machine learners and they're doing statistics in a completely different way. So we both have models and we're all super obsessed with p-values and with making absolutely sure that our conclusions about the model are correct and that our model actually expresses something uh, true about the data. We do all this p-value stuff and we get completely lost in different problems. And on the other side, there are these guys called these machine learners, machine learning researchers. And what they do is they just take a test set and a training set and they measure the predictive value of their model and that's good enough for them. They don't care about whether it's true or not. They just measure how well it predicts, i.e. measure the accuracy for a classifier. And that's all they're doing. And they're having a lot more fun than we are. And uh, statistics is really simple and it works really well. It's also really reliant on having lots and lots of data, I should say, which most uh, statisticians don't do. Um, so that's an important distinction to make and I think that explains a little bit why we are sometimes reluctant to apply too much statistical analysis to our results um, because things get very complicated. Um, people tend to overestimate the value of statistical analysis. So if you have a very strong p-value, people tend to overestimate that and um, read too much into it. For the community, it doesn't tend to promote the best work. Ultimately, we just don't see the best methods come out. And it sort of overshadows the way research is actually validated in the real world and, and in, on a longer time scale, which is by replication. So if I say I have a good method, I publish it and it turns out not to be a good method, somebody else tries it, it doesn't work for them, then it disappears. And I got a paper out of it, so nice for my career, but ultimately the best methods get selected not because of the best p-values, but because research is replicated and tried again and again and again. And that way the best models surface. Still, uh, oh yeah, sorry, these are two papers arguing that machine learning research shouldn't focus too much on statistical accuracy, uh, so uh, focus too much on statistical analysis. So basically they're saying just report your uh, accuracy, report your values, and just um, spend more time on analyzing your model and on understanding what your model does and why it's interesting than just trying to get higher and higher accuracy values and trying to get better and better p-values. But still, we should at least spend a little bit of time and we should not uh, be entirely afraid to use statistics. Um, so what this means for the project is that I can't really expect you to do statistical analyses if most of machine learning researchers don't do them. Um, so when you read the rubric, there will be something like basically this test set, training set thing is crucial. If you don't do this, we are going to punish you in your grade. If you don't do a statistical analysis, that's fine. If you do do it, you will be graded. You will be rewarded for the work you put in because it's difficult and it's sometimes worthwhile and you learn a lot, so we'll reward you for that. Uh, but you don't have to do it. Um, a good way to indicate how um, statistics is used, what statistics is used for, is to look first at error bars. So you will have seen this probably if you've read a, a paper or two. Some reported results, let's say somebody reports AUC over a couple of repeats, 
So they get mean values for their AUC. They put those in bar in a bar chart, and they put error bars on their bar chart. So if you see this in a paper, uh, and this is an open question, what do those error bars represent? How do you interpret this? What are these values here? That's one answer here, the variance. Anybody else? Anything else? All right. Um, as usual, it's a trick question, but the other way around, because any basically any answer is correct here. Error bars can show lots and lots of different things. So they can show variance or more commonly standard deviation, but that's the same thing. But they can also show standard error or they can show a confidence interval. And basically, if the researcher hasn't put in the caption under this image what the error bars re represent, the researcher has screwed up because you need to describe what your error bars mean. So let's look at these uh, different uh, ways of doing error bars. Specifically, before I explain what they mean, let's look at what happens when you sample more data. What happens to your error bars? Here we have a very small data set, and again, this, these are numbers I made up. We have some standard deviation, some standard error, and some confidence interval. And now we sample a bunch more data. Uh, in that case, our estimate of the standard deviation is going to get more accurate. The standard deviation itself is not going to change, because that's a property of our data distribution. But we're going to get a more accurate estimate of the standard deviation. In this case, it's gone up a little bit. The standard error and the confidence interval are very related. They express how sure we are about our estimate of the mean. This is an estimate of the mean of this data. So th this is the mean of the data, which is an estimate of the mean of the uh, data distribution. And the standard error expresses how sure we are of that data. So if we have more data, we get a better estimate of the mean, and the standard error reduces, and the confidence interval reduces. So they mean very different things. This is an indication of spread, how spread out is my data, which doesn't change if we get more data. And this isn't, these two are an indication of confidence. How confident are we about our estimate of the mean? Uh, standard error works like this. We sample some data from some population. So let's say we measure the, we do an experiment uh, 10 times. We measure some value like the AUC. These are our measurements. And we want to know the mean of this sample. Now, the mean is also a random variable in this sense. Because if we sample again, we get a different sample, so we get a different mean. So we can ask, what is the distribution of the outcome of this whole process? What is the distribution we get when we do this process? Take 10 samples and calculate the mean. We get another distribution. Oh, sorry. Another distribution, which is related to this distribution but it's much more narrow because there's much less variance in the mean. And the more data we sample here, the narrower this peak is gonna be. Specifically, if our original distribution has this, is, is a normal distribution with this standard deviation, then this distribution will have a standard deviation of the original standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size. And that's what we call the standard error of the mean, usually abbreviated by the standard error. Um, and just briefly, uh, we can use this to get what we call a confidence interval. So if we uh, look at this as a normal distribution, and if our sample size is big enough, we can think of this as a normal distribution, uh, 
Now we know that in a diff uh, if the distance from the mean uh, minus two, two times the standard deviation plus two times the standard deviation, that interval contains 95% of the probability mass. So that's what we call a 95% confidence interval for the mean. We are 99% confident that the mean, so instead of calculating the mean, like this, we calculate an interval such that we are 95% confident that the mean is somewhere in this interval. That's the confidence interval. A uh, little note on terminology here, which is important about confidence interval. Don't say this. Don't say the probability that the true mean is in the confidence interval is 95%. Why not, for those of you who did last week's homework? This is a frequentist approach. And frequentists don't believe in probability over anything except the outcome of repeated experiments. And the true mean is not the outcome of some experiment, it's some fixed universal value. So if we have an interval and we have a true mean, there is no probability that the interval is I that the mean is in the interval. It either is or it isn't. What you should say is a little bit more complicated. If we repeat this experiment many times, every time we compute a confidence interval, then the probability that the true mean is inside that confidence interval, or rather the proportion of those experiments where the true mean ends up inside the confidence interval, is 95%. So we're not defining probability on the true mean, because that stays the same. It's the confidence interval that changes randomly around the true mean in such a way that the true mean stays inside the confidence interval 95% of the time. So it's a statistic on the data. It's something we compute from the data like the mean, except here instead when you get more and more data, the interval gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, nice thing about confidence interval standard, uh, standard error and confidence interval bars is that we can get a bearing on whether the difference between them is significant or not. So with standard error, if they overlap, we know that there is not a significant difference. With confidence interval, if they don't overlap, we know that there is a significant dis difference. In both cases, if it doesn't hold, so here if they do not overlap, we don't know anything. And here if they do overlap, there might still be a significant difference, but there might also not. So these specifically are the two things we can uh, get. So to come back to that, there are two reasons to show statistics, to use statistics in machine learning. First, to show how confident we are about our estimates. And second, to show the spread in our data, to show the variance in, uh, in our results. Both are interesting, both are in, uh, informative for different reasons. I have to go through this a little bit quickly, but uh, if we do the same thing for accuracy, it works basically the same, except our source distribution is a Bernoulli distribution, so it's like a coin flip. So for every item in our data set, we check whether or not we classify correctly. We have some classifier. We check whether or not we classify correctly, and we get a series of these coin flips, and from that we estimate the accuracy. We estimate the probability of a correct classification. That's the accuracy of our classifier. So we take a bunch of samples. This is our test set in this case. And we get a mean for these samples, or we get a, a sum in this case, a sum total of correctly classified things and incorrectly classified things. And the result, uh, the expected uh, distribution here is a binomial distribution for which we can compute the confidence interval in the same way. So what I wanted to show you is this. If your uh, success probability is this, the true success probability is this, and you have some test set of either 100 uh, items, 1,000 items, or 10,000 items, how big is your confidence interval? And I was actually slightly shocked when I made this. I was expecting this to be much less, much lower. But let's say we have a test set of 100 items, and we want to show that it has a 
uh, we get an estimate of the success probability of 50-50. Then our error bars, our confidence interval around that estimate, is almost 0 0.2. So even though we report 0 0.5, what we're actually saying, we're pretty sure it's somewhere between 0 0.3 and 0 0.7, which is quite a margin of uncertainty because our test set is so small. So when I said your test set should be at least 100, uh, but preferably 1,000, that's because of this. Because even with 100 tests, 100 binomial tests, you still get a very high, um, very high confidence interval around your uh, estimated success rate. Um, I have a few things left over, so I um, misjudged uh, my timing. So I guess we will uh, skip resampling until later. There's not much to uh, say about that. We'll leave the analyzing results for here. And the no free lunch theorem we will save for the start of next lecture. Uh, so thank you for listening, and I will see you on Thursday morning. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I know, dead bird, but one more thing that is important, just one slide. Next Thursday are the next group sessions. So if your group number is below 30, next Thursday is your first group session where you have to present something, informally, but you have to present something. If you are not signed up for a group yet, it's uh, starting to get late. So make sure you sign up for a group uh, by the end of this week.